I have a dream. Four of the most powerful words ever spoken, I think. I'm sure that each one of you has a memory, a reaction, some kind of feeling when you hear those words. Just the beginning. Actually, it's the middle of the speech, but I have a dream. Martin Luther King spoke those words 57 years ago. How are we doing? We've made some progress, to be sure. And yet, we know that there is still much to do. And as I reflected on what I was going to say today, I felt that I could go two different ways. The first way that I considered going was with the talk that I had given in 2015, updated, I never do the same talk twice, but very much based on Reverend King's sermon, explaining it, taking it into a metaphysical place. And it's a very positive, uplifting, and it really gets that eye of a dream going. And that was one way that I could go. And yet, as I worked on this talk this week, everything that kept coming to me was about my journey and where we are as a country. Like, I don't want to talk just about what he said in 1963, those wonderful words, but where are we at now, in 2020? Kind of like if Martin Luther King were here today, what more would he be saying? He wouldn't give exactly the same speech, because there are some things that we have realized, and there are different things that we're aware of now. So I think that he would give a different talk if he were to be on the mall today. And I'm not beginning to think that I would be able to do exactly what he would do. But I do want to talk about, from my experience, what I think is important about having this dream. And the first thing that I think is important is to take this from I have a dream to we need to realize the dream. The dream needs to become reality. It's not enough just to have the dream. The fifth principle in unity is about action. So making the dream come alive. I have a dream and it's come alive. Now that would be a speech I'd want to hear on the wall, wouldn't you? Martin Luther King coming back and saying, look what we've done, look what we're doing. That's the speech that we need to live into. So that that speech could be delivered someday about how we reach the dream. And what part did you play in reaching the dream? I don't know about you, but I grew up in Naperville. So guess how many black people I knew growing up? Zero. Big whopping zero. So guess how many black people I went to school with? Zero. Until my sophomore year when Judy Scott entered Naperville North High School. We had one out of a class of 600, so a school of 2,400. We had one black person in my school. That was it. Then I went to COD, and I got to know a few more black people. And then I went into the workforce, and I started to work with all sorts of different people. But here's where I was at with it. I grew up in a household that wasn't overtly racist, but they, I would hear things from adults around me, you know, if there was ever conversations about what was happening with the black American community. Well, they have the same opportunities as everybody else. They're just not working hard enough. They're just not taking advantage of the opportunities. I had the same opportunities that they did, and look where I landed. So they must not be doing what I did. And that was the understanding, because you didn't know any different. You didn't know what that other experience was like, because you knew how many black people? Zero. You couldn't even talk to somebody to ask to them what their experience was like. And if you did just meet them, that's not the first thing you're going to ask them. It takes time to get into that. So I was lucky when I went to seminary, I got to know some people closely, and they made us take this class on diversity. Now, I had been a diversity trainer in my corporate world, so I'm like, yeah, I got this down. I know about diversity. <laughs> I'm not racist, 
right? I've never denied anyone of color a job, ergo, and I have never owned slaves, ergo, I am not racist. Any other white people have that thought ever in your life? Like, I didn't do it. I didn't bring anybody over here. I'm sharing honestly, transparently, but like, that's the thinking in a lot of white mind. So it's not really my problem, is kind of what I told myself. Like, well, they must just not be trying hard. Um, you know, we have the laws already set up, so I don't really understand what's going on, because, you know, I'm a woman. I also have, you know, my discrimination. So I was able to say that was other people's problems, um, and, and it really didn't affect me, and I was not creating the problem. So I could feel okay about that. I'm not creating, and I'm not contributing to the problem. So I don't need to do anything about it. And then I got woke. I moved to Montclair, New Jersey, which is a very diverse town, one of the most diverse towns in the country. So instead of my church having zero or one or two minorities, it was about a third Hispanic, a third black, and a third white, just like the town. And so I dropped into the middle of this. And at first, I didn't understand when the black ministers in town would talk about the education gap in town. Same schools, kids get to go to everything, but there was an education gap with the black students and the white students. Hmm. Remembering my past? Well, they are going to the same schools. Are they not trying as hard? Is that what it is? And so I'm listening, and I'm learning, and I'm listening, and I'm learning, and one day I have coffee with Elizabeth, other Elizabeth, from literally the other side of town. And she tells me that she's going to teach a class that night where she gives the black men in her community the talk. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. She's on her head. The talk, where you tell the young men how they are to behave when they are stopped by a police officer. Anybody in here ever get that talk? I never got that talk. My brother didn't get that talk. But she was giving the talk because it was a matter of life and death in her community. Hold your hands like this. Yes, sir, no, sir, don't reach for anything. Don't roll the window down till they tell everything like that. And I thought, I don't have to give the kids in my church that talk. But she did. And then, a few years later, the Montclair Clergy Association got ourselves in some trouble. I had no idea. So the black parents had gone to the school board to complain about the education gap. And they had gotten loud, and they were yelling. And the school board, made up of mixed races, was telling them to be quiet and to sit down. And then there was an editorial in the paper because the school board came to the clergy association and they said, clergy, we need to bring peace to this situation. Will you write a letter to the editor on behalf of the clergy association saying, let's all be civil when we talk about the education gap. We don't want to be yelling. I don't even remember exactly what we said. And we all signed off on it. People from the Unitarian Church, the Congregationalist Church, the Unity Church, and that's when the fireworks started. So the next week, there was a letter in the paper from one of the black ministers on the other side of town saying, how dare you, Montclair Clergy Association, have we learned nothing from Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail? Sit down, be quiet. It's inconvenient for us that you're making noise. I had never read the letter. Well, I got myself schooled in just about, not everything, but a lot of what Martin Luther King actually wrote and said, and that's exactly what we had fallen into, the same thing. White people telling black people to be quiet, to know their place, to not speak out, to not make trouble, to behave nicely, and that was not what was needed. So we wrote an apology, we wrote a retraction, we tried to make it as good as we could, but I, like I said, woke up and said, I need to think about things with a different sensitivity as a white person of power and privilege that I didn't know I had 
until they taught me that in seminary. That it's about power. It's about a power differential. And it doesn't matter whether you created it or not. It's there. White minority. The power is already there in the system. And so, after we went through this experience, I actually went to Birmingham. I didn't get to see the jail cell where he was in, but I got to see a mock-up of it. So I went to the Birmingham Civil Rights Museum, which is right across the street from the church that was bombed, where the little girls died. And I got to experience that, and I got to talk to somebody, a white couple that was there, looking at it with them, and they said, you know, we lived here when this happened. But the black people really had everything we had. I mean, yeah, their stores were different. They still had stores. I mean, yeah, they were over on that edge of town, but they were causing a lot of trouble. It was still there, people. It hadn't gone anywhere. They were touring it just like me to learn and to grow. But it was still alive. And I went to a party not long ago where someone was down in Atlanta and she'd had a little too much to drink. And she said to one of the guys at the party, so come on, she was from up here, tell me the truth. Is the whole South just racist? And he said, well, yes, ma'am, I think we are. That's what he said. I didn't say it. That's what he said. And so Martin Luther King taught us to have compassion for everyone, to see the oneness in everyone, to bring black children and white children, to bring everyone together. That was his dream. His dream was unity's second principle that we all know that God is in all of us, everywhere present, that we all know that, and that we're not separate. And so I no longer could say, but I'm one of the good white people. I'm one of the good ones that, you know, I don't say nasty words and think those things, and I realized more was called of me than what I had been doing. And as I read some of his writings, some of the things that he said, one of the most famous ones that we've probably all quoted in different ways, it's he who passively accepts evil is as much involved in it as he who helps to perpetuate it. He who accepts evil without protesting against it is really cooperating with it. And then Joan walked in today. Show him your shirt, Joan. So Joan walked in, this was not planned. She walks in with the Black Lives Matter shirt. She walked in with that shirt, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, because that isn't popular everywhere. You know, there's the safer antidote to that. Black Lives Matters? All Lives Matters. Right. And Joan's shaking her head. No. Yes, of course, all lives matter. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a specific situation and a group of people that needs attention. We are talking about an issue that we have been covering up and we need to stop. And All Lives Matters is basically what we call white fragility. That white people get so sensitive about this that they have to get defensive. Well, I suffer too. <laughs> no, not the same thing, different. And it's not about you right now. It's not about you. And so with open hearts of compassion and remembering that God is at work in every situation and there are actions that we need to take, that as people of power, if you are in power and if you are white, you already are. And the thing about white fragility that is this, there's a wonderful woman who came up with the phrase, Robin D'Angelo. If you haven't heard of her, Susan's nodding her head, she's fantastic on this. Robin D'Angelo, she was just here and I missed her. She was just um, in one of the other towns. So she says, one of the things I try to work with white people on is letting go of our criteria about how people of color give us feedback. We have to build our stamina to be just as humble and to bear witness to the pain we and the slick thing about whiteness is that you can reap the benefits of a racist society without personally being racist. It's no longer enough to just think, I don't deny people housing. 
there's more to it than that, and that's this whole issue of institutional racism that we've become aware of. That's what Martin Luther King would be preaching about today, isn't it? That's what he would be pre preaching about. And it's difficult. It's difficult to see it. And so as a person of power, my job is to lower my screen of defensiveness and to be open and vulnerable. To sit with someone of color when they tell me about how the system hasn't worked for them. And to listen and to care instead of wanting to reach in to defend, but, but, but you had this chance, or why don't you do this? And a few years ago, I was really rocked when I went to Chautauqua, which is out in New York. It's a, a wonderful, magical place. It's like spiritual, intellectual Disney world for grown-ups. And they have a theme every week, and the theme that I was there as a guest uh, visiting Unity Minister that week the theme of it was the ethics of dissent. That is about as non-unity a topic as you could find, right? I want to do the warm and fuzzy one. We're all one Kumbaya week. And it was the only week that was open. And I tell you, I did not want to go that week. Because, you know, in our roots, we are not a dissenting denomination. In our roots, Charles Fillmore told us not to really get too involved in the outer world. It's like the opposite of the Unitarians that are like, we are out here in the world. Oh yeah, and there's some God stuff we need to do. They're like fixing the world and we're like doing all of our inner work. But now we're starting to come out. We're starting this process. And so when I went to Chautauqua, the ethics of dissent, whew, did I get a week in social justice and activism and my Montclair time just fed right into it. And I went to a panel of three social justice activists. The first one was Tamika Mallory. Anybody know who Tamika Mallory is? We should all know who she is. She is one of the three founders of the Women's March. And then there was a gentleman by the name of Sean King who was an activist and Edwin Lindo. And they did a little panel discussion and they were real. It was three people of color and about 2,000 white people. Most of the people in Chautauqua are white. Okay? So they gave us a learning that day, and it was powerful. It's on YouTube. I just found it recently. You can watch the whole hour-long segment. It was life-changing for me. So Tamika talked about how she gets to hear all sorts of things, and so people will say, you know what? You just need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, bootstraps right? You know, black people just need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And she looked at us and she said, people, we don't even have boots. We need the boots first. That's how far the differential is. And then Edwin Lindo shared a story. There were, well, there's all the shootings that we know about, right? And then here was a shooting that he told us about that didn't make it really any of the newspapers. There was a Hispanic man a few years ago in San Francisco sitting on a hill having an ice cream cone but he wasn't where he should have been, and they shot him dead. All he was doing was eating an ice cream cone while being Hispanic. That's all it took. And then Sean King shared with us about the fact that he could be walking in a neighborhood where he can be, but he didn't look like he belonged, so someone calls the police. Police come up and they check on him and they see what's going on. And he said to us, white people, stop calling the police. When you call the police on each other, they just come by. When you call the police on a person of color, they die. And so there is someone who had done that. They had called the police and reported that someone was in the area and the person ended up killed. They weren't doing anything at that time, but miscommunication and all of that, they were dead. And he tracked that caller down and confronted them. Just because a black person was walking in their neighborhood and they made a phone call, they died. So he takes it very seriously and goes out now and makes it his life's work to find those people who make those calls. People were, are dying here. It's serious. 
And if it weren't for the video cameras showing some of these arrests and what's really happened, we might continue to think, well, they must have done something. But there are issues in the system and they are not easily solved. But they can begin with our teachings about oneness and compassion and strength. I think it takes strength to look at this issue and to not just set it aside. And Joan met Trayvon Martin's mother a couple of times, and that sounds like she had a similar experience to me. Like as, as a little old white lady, as I, I, used to, I wrote a column called Confessions of a White Girl. She called herself that to me. I didn't say that to her. What can one little old white lady do? What can one middle-aged white lady do? What, what can we do? And, and what did she tell you? She said to just, just stand true to what you know. Stand true to what you know and don't be afraid, right? Didn't she say that? Have, like, have courage. And so instead of just setting this issue on the, on the um, shelf or pulling it out once a year to feel good. Hey, I did a talk on Martin Luther King. I should get a check mark here. Like, no, it's about more than that now. It's about following those three writers that I told you about. It's about keeping myself informed when there's the next march, I'm gonna go, just like the environment, like really caring, like watching, even though I didn't wanna watch it, a documentary on reconstruction that Arturo rented from the library by Henry, Henry Louis Gates. And my really reconstruction ended being about the lost cause. You know what the lost cause is? Does anybody know what the lost cause is, noob? No, see, we don't even know. Our turn knows because he watched the video. The lost cause of the South, states' rights, that really the Civil War was about states' rights. And so the lost cause had to be rescued, and that's why they built statues, and that's why they changed the history narrative. Like, he blows my mind when I really start learning. And it gives me hope. It could be very discouraging, and there are days when it is, but it gives me hope that if we follow what Martin Luther King told us to do, the center that is set up in his name, said that you should begin with information and education and discussion with other people. That there is hope if you become educated, that if you get involved, that if you know people, when your friend tells you that as a black man, he is afraid to walk outside some days. You wake up. I've never been afraid to go outside of my home, but a middle-aged, well-off, 65-year-old retired black friend of mine told me that. Another friend of mine told me that she regretted ever having children because she has to worry about them every day, whether they're gonna get shot, especially the boys. And she really honestly wished she hadn't that can change. The dream is still waiting for us to make it a reality. And so I'm going to remind us a little bit about the dream that he gave us. Because I believe that we do care enough. I believe that if I can get woken up from Naperville, Illinois, knowing nobody, but finding the right people and the right speeches and going on the internet, that anyone can do it. So I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. And I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as brothers and sisters. I have a dream today. This is our hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation 
into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. And when this happens, and when we finally let freedom reign, when we let it reign from every village, and every hamlet, and every state, and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men, white men, Jews, Gentiles, Protestants, and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of that old spiritual Negro. Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last.
from the demands of the outer world and to come once again home, home to myself, this deeper self always running in the background, always guiding me, supporting me, strengthening me, a place of rejuvenation and rest, a place for wisdom, unspeakable joy, all things in the outer world begin here. such a perfect place of peace and love and happiness. And if that place is one that I can go to, I can bring it with me. I don't leave it here for meditation. I realize that this place is with me all the time. It is the essence of who I am. Bring it with me into conversations, into my work, into school, into all my activities. This sanctuary, with all of God's blessings, is now infused into every area of my life. And so it is.